more shackles and no more chains. Hallelujah. We have seen and we will continue to see victories through him. Hallelujah.
was trying to turn some things around in our lives, that was trying to make it to where we would give up on God. But I'm standing here today telling you, He turned it for my good. He turned it around so we can say, instead of giving up and saying, no more, I can't stand it anymore, we are standing here today in the new year saying, I made it because God turned it around. I turned my hatred on what was happening and turned it to praise to where I was saying, thank you, Jesus, for keeping keeping me safe, for keeping me in your will, for keeping me in your church. There is no reason that we cannot praise his wonderful name. We're saying thank you for keeping me, God, when I thought I was going to lose a battle. Hallelujah. Let's praise his wonderful name. You take what the enemy meant for evil, and you turn it going to fail on us. He's never just going to leave us. He's always there.
Oh, hallelujah. Why don't you go ahead and do that today? Hallelujah. Can you bless his name? Oh, yes, I will, Lord. I know where I'm at, Lord, on the mountaintop or in the valley, Lord. I'm going to bless your name. Yeah, you are worthy, Lord. You are my deliverer, Lord. You are my strong tower. Oh, yes, I will. Praise your name, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, it's a decision that you can make right now that no matter what comes my way, I am going to bless the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. No matter what comes in my path, I am going to lift him up. Hallelujah. Oh, yes, amen. presence of the Lord in this place. How about you? Yes, yes. Hallelujah. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Thank you for the praise team doing an excellent job as usual. I do sincerely appreciate the work that you do. And Brother Lucas, if you would come and wait on the congregation to receive the Lord's tithes and your offerings, uh, I would appreciate it. Thank you for your faithfulness over the holidays. And sickness and all the other things that went along with it. It's good to see each and every one of you here. And for those that are not able to be with us in person, hopefully you can join us online. In Jesus' name, God will bless you. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. I would uh, like to remind you of the uh, special things that are going on this week, or I'm sorry, this month. On the 17th, Brother Tyler Sullivan will be with us, evangelist preaching on Sunday morning, I'm sorry, Sunday afternoon, and then the next Sunday, I believe it is the 24th, uh, Brother Doyle Champlain will be speaking, and I'm looking forward to hearing from both of them, hallelujah. As I said last week, I believe it was, if you have somebody that is backslidden, if you have somebody that is cold in Christ, if you have somebody that has never received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, this would be a good month for that to happen, amen? This would be a good time for them to start the year out on the right foot, if you will. Amen. Uh, we also have a youth bonfire. It'll be at our house. There'll be a few churches coming together. We'll be social distancing. We have 10 acres for you to social distance over. If you want to wear your mask, if you want to come there, young people, we want to see you. I think it's going to be a great time of fellowship. I'm sick of this stay-at-home thing. I am sick of not seeing my friends, fellowshipping and having a good time and fellowship with the Lord and his people. If you would stand, I'd like to read my text, then I'll let you be seated again. It's in 2 Peter, the third chapter and the ninth verse. And, uh, I hope this is a familiar scripture to you. It says, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. As some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward. Everybody say usward. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. You can look at your neighbor and say, God is not slack. God is not slack. You may be seated. God is not slack. I've looked at the definition of what slackness is. There's some, there's some interesting Bible terminology that maybe has kind of gone out of our vocabulary. But usually if you have somebody like at work, your boss that is riding you, that is expecting way too much or if your mom and dad are trying to get you to clean your room and do your chores and get out of bed before noon, usually we'll say, why don't you cut me some slack? Slackness. Older term, I guess. We always used to say, give me some slack. Because slackness is looseness, the state opposite of tension. It's not rigid. It is negligence, inattention, as the slackness of men in business or duty, slackness in the performance of engagement, slowness, tardiness, want of tendency as the slackness of flesh to heal, its weakness and not intense. Slackness. I want to 
come today to tell somebody, maybe everybody, but that has nothing to do with what God is. He is not weak. He is not slow. He is not all these things that men count as slackness. God is not slack. I believe the return of Christ in the end of this earth, or the rapture of the church, is going to happen. No man knows the day or the hour, the Bible says. That does not mean that there is not a day and an hour and a minute and a second when God is going to say, that's it, Gabriel, blow the horn. I am ready to be united with my bride. I am ready for the church to rule and reign with me. No man knows the day or the hour. We just don't know it as human beings. But there is a time when the trumpet is going to sound, my brothers and sisters. The dead in Christ are going to rise first. And the, we which are alive and remain shall be caught up to be with the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be. I am not looking for the Antichrist. I am looking for Jesus Christ. You can look at everything around you and say, where's the Antichrist? Where's this happening? Where's that thing with tin horns and all those other things? What I am looking for is a powerful move of Jesus Christ in this last day. And I'm looking for him to step out on the clouds of glory, if you will, and call me home to ever be with the Lord. Hallelujah. Human nature is a funny thing. Knows that if he gave us the date, if he gave us the day and the hour, depending on your personality types, and maybe Sister Carissa can give us some examples of personality types, but whatever yours is, you'd probably wait until 10 years before the coming or 10 minutes or 10 seconds before you started getting your life ready for the coming of the Lord. Whatever your procrastination level is, when you would start running around like crazy and trying to get everything because in 36, it's like the countdown for New Year's. If you uh, are the smartphone type, there's a, an app out there, and I'll let out on a little secret for you parents and people that are raising teenagers. It's called Life 360, and it's beautiful. You can allow people to track your every movement. If you are a teenager in my house, you don't have that choice. You will allow yourself to be tracked on your every movement. And as my son and daughter know, if you want to get mom's attention, turn off your tracking option on Life360. It would probably be best if you just left it on and went and did what you were going to do. There may have been a, a time or two when someone looked at the app and they saw that Sister Amy's location was right around the corner. And they waited until the very absolute last second that they possibly could before they jumped out of bed and got dressed and started a load of laundry and took out the trash and washed the dishes and started on their homework or started doing all the things that they should have been doing all day long. But when they saw that mom had just turned off of 65 onto Nelson Road, folks, it's time to turn it into turbo drive and get some things accomplished to try and confuse her to think that we have been working all day. I'm afraid that that would be the human nature if the Lord told us that the rapture is going to happen on X day is we would wait until that 10 minutes before and then we would start getting busy about the work of the Lord. There's a little tone in the phone that I have that announces when Sister Amy is about to pull into the driveway. And I don't know how it happened. It was probably just the grace of God, but it happens when she is about a quarter of a mile down the road, it says, Amy has arrived at home, which is very good for me because I know when that noise goes off, I've got about 30 seconds to get out of bed and get dressed and do the laundry and no, no, all those things. I don't do any of that. 
But there's something else, and there's a, another thing, I guess you would say, in my house that knows the tone of that phone. It knows what is going to happen in just a few minutes when that tone goes off, and it's Marco the dog. He gets excited when that tone goes off. He knows what is going to happen. He can't see it. He can't feel it. He can't do anything, but he knows a certain sound. And when my phone goes off, Marco can be asleep on the foot of the bed, and his head comes up, and his ears go forward, and he jumps off the bed, and he begins to get excited. The one that washes him, the one that feeds him, the one that cares for him is almost home. The one that bought him, the one that rescued him in the parking lot of the store, the one that gave him a home, that took care of him when he is sick, he gets all excited because it is almost here. Jumps up where he's lying around and he begins barking and he begins pacing and he begins running around the house and he is whining in anticipation of Sister Amy walking through the door. The one that I love is just around the corner. The one that I love is getting ready to walk in the door. Hallelujah. I believe the day of the return of Jesus Christ is close at hand and it's time right now to get your life right with God. It's time to set your priorities. It's time to have some faith. It's time to do the work of God. Now is the time to prioritize his kingdom and not my castle. Every day that I'm breathing, I'm looking for the return of Jesus Christ. Like it may be put on my marker if I die before the coming of the Lord. I would like it to say the dates and then the bottom say waiting the rapture, Acts 2.38. I want everybody that walks by my marker not to say beloved father and all that other stuff, but I want them to know that there is somebody sitting there waiting for the return of Jesus Christ. I know the one that bought me, the one that saved me, the one that takes care of me, the one that feeds me, the one that nourishes me, the one that saved me is coming and I am anticipating his soon return. Hallelujah. Peter, in this writing, is writing to tell the church that God is not slack. Telling us that he is faithful. He's telling us to have faith in the promises of God. And Peter continues to answer the mocking. He's writing because there were some mockers in those days that said, Hey, the Lord said he was going to return, and we haven't seen him yet. Hey, where's this Jesus guy? And they, they began to mock and make fun and, and tell the people that you're believing in a bunch of fables and things that aren't true. And that's why he is writing this. He's answering those false teachers, and he's answering those that are working on the Christians of the day to break down their faith and to get them to believe a lie. They ask, when is the promise of Jesus coming. It's been too long. Christ is not coming. You might as well give up. Don't don't go don't don't bother about the way you're living. You can go out and live any way you want. You can be immoral. You can go anywhere you want. You can say anything you want and be anything you want to be, but though there's something Peter in verse 8 urges the readers to remember that the Lord is not bound by human time. For God uh, thousand years is like a day and a day is like a thousand years. Peter's point is this, that God does not suffer the limitation of time, of confusion about it. He's not worried about it. He doesn't, not going to be surprised. It's not going to be like me when I'm sitting around the house and all of a sudden my calendar rings and I'm like, oh man, I've got to be somewhere in 20 minutes. It's, it's not like that. God's not like that. He's not bound to time, but he knows exactly what he's doing. He knows when the fullness of time will come, he is going to step out, call us home. Verse, Peter insists that we cannot apply human demands about time to the promises of God. He is not slow in keeping his promises. God is the one that makes the schedule. He can't be late. Meet those people that they're always late to the party. 
and they will usually say, well, the party's not going to get started until I get there anyway, so I'm really not late. That is kind of the way it is with the Lord. The rapture isn't going to happen until he steps out and says it's time to come home. Don't worry about when it's going to happen. Don't try and put a, a date and a time and all these other things on it. I believe in looking around us and knowing when the sign of the times, but don't be so worried about it that you're looking. Lord, are you coming tomorrow and allowing your faith to be challenged? But know that if the Lord said he is coming back, he is going to return for us. God keeps every promise at the perfect time for his glory and for the good of those he loves. In this case, Christians should view the delay in Christ's return as evidence of God's patience, not his tardiness. That again, he, we should review return his his delay in Christ's return, we should view it as evidence, if you will, of his patience, not of his tardiness. In his love-driven patience, God is willing to give more time for more people to come to repentance. This is God's plan to allow more people the opportunity to place their trust in Christ in order to enter into an eternal relationship with him. I don't know why, and I hate politics, as most of you know, but I don't know why our president was elected president. I know a lot of people voted for him, that's, that's why, but I don't know why God allowed that to happen. It seemed like the world, it seemed like America was on a, a head-on course with the rapture of the church, and there was going toward one world government and one church, and it seemed like everybody was involved in getting that to happen, and all of a sudden, some guy stepped on the scene and said, stop, we are not doing that, and for the next four years, God, I believe, has given the church four more years to work about getting the lost converted. He's given us time. He's given the sinner space. What are we going to do with the extra time before the rapture? He's not giving us more time so we can have a better house. He's not giving us more time so we can work on our education. And I want you to have a nice house and get as bad edu the best education you can. But that is not why he is delaying the rapture. If he's delaying it, he's delaying it out of the goodness and the mercy of his heart. That he wants everyone that can to come to repentance. God doesn't want anyone to perish or die. The overall message of scripture is that God does not desire anyone's damnation. He would prefer that everyone would be saved. He didn't come to the earth and die and give his blood so just a couple people could be saved. He didn't have the Holy Ghost poured out and Peter say to whosoever will. He didn't tell them to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature because he didn't mean it. The Lord Jesus Christ wants every soul, every soul to be saved. This strong message, this promise so well articulated comes from someone who seems to have a good understanding of the promises of God. Maybe the author, Peter, had had a few moments in his life that he dropped the ball. Anybody want to be honest in 2021 that you dropped the ball a couple of times? Peter didn't live up to his own expectations. He didn't quite hit the mark every time, hit the mark that he was aiming at. Does it sound familiar? I believe that I have the privilege to pastor a lot of overachievers. I believe that there are a lot of people in this church that are going to be better Christians than I am. They are going to preach the gospel and convert more people than I will. They are going to be able to build churches in places that I would never be able to build them in. I want to tell you, I believe that the Lord has a work for every one of us to do in the kingdom of God. You can achieve whatever God wants in your life. Some people in this place that have set some goals and they have achieved them, 
despite life, despite unexplained situations, despite all the things, the unforeseen disasters and the unforeseen obstacles that they may have to get over, there are things that are going to come along to try and dissuade you. There are going to be some things that are going to come along and try to derail you. They are going to try to deter you and to distract you, but yet here you are in the first Sunday of 2021 saying, Lord, I will sing your praise. Lord, I'll lift you high in my lowest valley. Yes, I will. Here you are. So many times I look into the lives of people in the Bible and I I read their stories about all the things that they have done. The, I read their sermons. I, I marvel at the power of their anointing. I, I read about the miracles that they were able to perform in the name of Jesus. I, I look at their boldness and their determination. I, I look at the disciples that didn't want to be crucified like their Lord. They said they weren't worthy, and they said, turn me upside down when you crucify me. That doesn't even comprehend. I can't even comprehend the level of determination, the level of boldness. Boldness, the level of commitment that they had in their lives. Think that sometimes when you read those stories that they never had a bad day, that they, they never had a time when they doubted what was going on. They, they never had a moment where they were wondering what was going to happen in their ministry and what was going to happen in their family. Is my ministry even effective and should I just go back to what I was doing before my conversion? Even in your worst time, when you're at your lowest point, the, the worst day of your spiritual walk, if you will, when you have doubted our failure, our sins, reveal God's character to us because he is good and patient. Thankful for anointed singers that were able to sing the song that goes along just exactly with this sermon. When you are at your lowest, when you're in your darkest valley, if you will, God is not slack concerning his promises to you. It's not the promise to your mom and dad, but God has promises for you. He's got promises for your future. He's got promises for your salvation. He's got promises for your ministry. Why? Because he is good and patient. When you're at your lowest point, he's not slack. When you're at your, your spiritual zenith, God is not slack concerning his promises. I like to look in the book of Acts and look at the life of Peter and say, wow, what an amazing man of God. And yes, he was. But I believe that there were times in Peter's life when he began to look back over his life, as the song says, when I look back over my life and I think it all over, I can truly say that I've been blessed. I've got a testimony. Many times in our life, though, we, we go through life like this, walking backwards. We are so focused on everything that happened in the past. We're so focused on all of our failures and all the things that went wrong in our life, the people that hurt us, the people that abused us, the things that went wrong in my life that we never have time to look around and say, Lord, where are you leading me? I can look back over my life and say, I've got a testimony. And I'm not going to let the things that happened in my life to deter me from believing what the Lord has for me in the future. Remember the, the story of Peter. We can go back. We've got the we've got the story. And one of the things, remember him and the disciples, they they were so tired of the kids being around Jesus and all the noise and whatever they were doing and disturbing that they told Jesus, hey, can we just get rid of all these kids and can we get these babies out of here? Remember when he stepped up into the boat and in a moment of faith, in a moment of confidence, he asked to walk on the water. But as soon as he took a couple of steps on the water, something started chatting in his ear. What do you think you're doing out here outside the boat? You've been a fisherman all your life. You are going to sink. And I don't even know if Peter knew how to swim, but he began to look at the waves and the conditions around him instead of keeping his eye on the Lord Jesus Christ. And he started to sink, and the Lord had to reach down, pick him up, and walk him back to the boat. We remember that, Peter. Peter resisted the single greatest reason Jesus 
became man and came was to atone the sins of the human race. And when he began to fight against that, saying, Lord, not you're not going to the cross, the Lord looked to him and said, Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me. You have, do not mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Peter? Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. Absolutely no way. Jesus had to look at him and says, Peter, unless I wash your feet, you have no part in me. Peter, on the time that I remember in a garden called Gethsemane where Jesus asked you specifically to come and pray with him. And as he sweat, the great drops of blood and his torment before his, his uh, crucifixion, here Peter let the Lord down again by not even being able to stay awake for one hour. Can you imagine what it must have heard or sounded like to hear the Lord praying and having such passion about what he was going to do? Peter, how could you have went to sleep that moment, probably the most recognized denial was when with oaths and with curses in a, in a very public arena, Jesus is told that, or Jesus was denied by Peter. He said, I don't know him. I, I'm not one of them. I, I've never been with them. I, I don't know it. Com Peter, completely overwhelmed by his sin, his self-discovery of his own weaknesses, and he quits the apostolic team of the day, and he goes back to the only work that he thought he had to do. He turned in his Fisher for Men card, and he got back his Fishing for Fish card, and he just went fishing. And he stayed there until Jesus restored him. But God knew what he was doing when he called Peter, and God knows what he's doing when he called you and I. God didn't miss the mark when he said, follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. When he prophesied about Peter's ministry, he knew there was a rooster in his future. There were going to be some things that Peter was going to do. There was going to be some failures. There was, there was going to be some mistakes. There was, there was going to be some shortcomings. For the rest of Peter's life, I believe that every time a rooster crowed, every, every morning when he got up, he remembered the trial. He remembered the accusation. He remembered the mistake. The fear that he felt that night came over him again. Something tells me that he didn't just remember that, but every time that rooster crowed, he remembered the mistake, the, the failure that he had, but he also remembered the grace and the mercy of God that called Peter back. He remembered the power of repentance, and he felt the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ washing over him. Look what happens in Mark, the 16th chapter and the first verse. It says, and when the Sabbath day was passed, Mary Magdalene and her and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, had brought sweet spices that they might come and anoint him. And barely early in the morning, the first day of the week, they came unto the sepulcher at the rising of the sun. And they said among themselves, who shall roll us away the stone from the door of the sepulcher? You ever done that halfway to do something? Oh, wait, I forgot something here. Who's going to roll away this stone? This, these three people going there, we're not going to have this ability to roll away the stone. But Adam, when they looked, they saw that the stone was rolled away, for it was very great. And entering into the sepulcher, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, clothed in long white garment, and they were affrightened. And he said unto them, Be not affrightened. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. The angel could have stopped right there. But as the oracle of God, he told them, to say, he told them this. But go your way, tell his disciples and Peter that he goeth before you into Galilee, there shall ye see him as, ye, as he said unto you. And they went out quickly and fled from the sepulcher, for 
they trembled and were amazed. Neither said they anything to any man, for they were afraid. Here the angel is giving a report. He, he's telling them to go and tell the good news to the disciples. And you see, there was only one that he called out specifically out of all the followers, all the disciples that were there. He said, was Peter, would you go and tell the disciples and, and don't forget Peter. Of all the ones that need to know right now that I am risen from the dead, it's Peter. I want you to go to the one that's the lowest and tell him. I want you to go find Peter and let him know that in his place he is forgiven. I want you to let him know that he's still got the keys to the kingdom of heaven. I want you to let Peter know you're still in the driver's seat. Peter, you are still my anointed. Peter, I want you to know that you have value in the kingdom of God matter how bad it looks in the middle of your failure, there is a God that is reaching for you today. When you've messed up, he's reaching for you. When you have not lived up to your own expectations, there's a God that's reaching for you. When you have let yourself and others down, there's a God that's saying, would you go tell them that I still love them? Would you go tell them that I still died for them? Hallelujah. If you've ever been living for yourself, and not for God. There's a God that is reaching for you. If you have to be reminded of your to yourself of the promises that God has made to you, there is a God that loves you. Would you quit looking at the failures and remind yourself of the promise? Quit listening to the rooster and remember the word of the Lord that tells you, I love you, I died for you, I redeemed you, I, you have value. My blood is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. Go tell my disciples and Peter. God has the ability to give a word to an entire group, but today he also has the word, the ability to talk to an individual. I wonder if we could stand today. God told me to tell the church in, in general, but to somebody in particular, that he is not slack concerning his promises. I don't care if you have to tell yourself this a hundred times before you get out of bed every morning, but somebody needs to know that God is not slack concerning his promises. He is not slack concerning what he wants to do in your life. He's not slack about the coming again. He is not slack about having a triumphant church. He is not slack about salvation. He is not slack about washing you in the blood of the Lamb. Not slack concerning his promises, but he's wanting everyone to come to repentance. He is long-suffering. Be thankful for a long-suffering God. He said, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is sufficient for you. My grace is enough. My grace is adequate. My grace is satisfactory. That's what sufficient means. No matter where you might find yourself today, here in this congregation or online, I want to tell somebody that the Lord's grace is enough. The Lord's grace is adequate. The Lord's grace is satisfactory for whatever place you might find yourself in today. If you are away from God, if you are not living where you know you need to be, with the Lord, if you are not living up to your potential in Jesus Christ, come to repentance and reestablish yourself in Christ. If you think you went too far, if you think that he doesn't love you anymore, if you think he doesn't know where you're at, God will speak to you. If you will just stop where you're running from and you will allow him to, he will speak into your life right now. He will call you. He will send others to tell you. 
he will give a message to this old preacher to come into your home or into this sanctuary to tell you no matter where you are, the Lord Jesus Christ wants to tell you that he is risen and his grace is sufficient for you. If you will spend some time in prayer, he will talk to you in a time in prayer. Maybe we can think back over our life and think about all the failures, but I want you not to only do that, but I want you to begin to think about the promises that God has made to you. The promises that he's made in this book right here that to all of us, but I know that God has given specific promises to people that are standing in here individually. He wants to build you up in that time of prayer. He wants to reassure you in that time of prayer. He wants to build up your life for you to be able to say, Lord, I have found my place in you. I have got back to the place where I need to be. Some others have told you the things that the Lord wants to do. However the information has come to you, some the Lord, the Spirit of God is telling you and only you. Don't worry about how it's going to happen. Don't worry about the logistics. Don't worry about what it's going to look like in two months or three months. But would you just step out in a show of faith and say, Lord, I'm going to believe you that you are not slack concerning your promises and you are going to bring it to pass. You are going to bring it to fulfillment in my life. You're listening to the doubt and would you listen to the Savior today? Peter wouldn't have listened. Peter wouldn't have heard the call of God calling him back to the place where he needs to be. I'm sure somebody else would have stepped up on the day of Pentecost and they would have preached the gospel message. But oh, what a legacy that Peter has to be able to be the first one to proclaim the power of the Holy Ghost and the plan of salvation to those and to be the one that preached the message that's had 3,000 people converted. And one day, to be able to say, Lord, I took the message just like you told me to. I took the keys, if you will, and I went to the Gentiles, and I began to open up doors of salvation to people that have never seen it and never heard about you. And I began to show them the power of God wants to work in their life. Would you listen to what the Lord is calling and asking you to do today? You see, there were two people on that time when the Lord was crucified that made critical mistakes. Errors in judgment jumped the gun. One was named Peter and we read about him. But there was another one by the name of Judas. like to talk about Peter because that's the one that repented and that the Lord restored and that's the one that the Lord gave amazing ministry to. That's the one who's going to see in heaven but there was another one by the name of Judas that when he realized his mistake, the Bible says he went out and he wept sore. There was probably some shame when he realized what he had done and how it all kind of the wheels came off the wagon. And here he found himself selling out the Savior for the price of a slave. He went out and he wept sore, but there was no repentance in the heart of Judas. We know Judas ended up taking his life. His, he was never called back. He was never able to go back and preach a sermon. He was never able to watch his shadow pass over people and then be healed. He never was able to put his hand on a hanky and anoint it and send it out. And wherever that hanky went, people were healed. He never got to be able to, ex, to experience that. Why? Because he never found a place of repentance. He never found a place where he could reconnect with the power of God. He never found a place in his life where he could look back and say, Lord, I've made a mistake, but if you will come down and forgive me, I will believe the promises that you have given because even in my failures, Lord, you are not slack concerning your promises. Hallelujah. 
Hallelujah. I'm going to open up this altar. If you would like to come around, you can, but if you'd like to stay where you are, that's, that's fine too. I believe the Spirit of God is calling us, and I'm not really a big one for spirit, for New Year's resolutions. If you are, you may come, and I've already broken mine, so it's all right. But in this year, I want the Lord to, to transform the way we look at ourselves. I want the Lord to be able to work with us and even say, Lord, I'm not going to hide my failures anymore. I'm not going to try and shove them down, but when I look at my failures, I'm going to remember the power of regeneration. I'm going to look at the power of the cross. I'm going to look at the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and those failures, when I look at them, they're not going to remind me of what a failure I am, but they're going to remind me what a wonderful compassion is. Savior, you are. Hallelujah. Would you come
chapter and the 13th verse. There's a uh, kind of a trend. There's a lot of people that come up with themes for their... Oh, I like it. It kind of keeps us focused. I was thinking about themes for 2020 or 2021. I know it's probably not proper or all that stuff, but I think I'm just going to go with forget about it. Forget about it. 2020, all the things that happened, we need to have a really good case of amnesia. Look what Philippians chapter 3 and verse 13. Here's another one, Paul. Living, killing. He was good at it. He had the law on his side and he went out and was destroying the people of the name of Jesus. You know the story. God had a plan for him and he called him on the road one day with a, a bright light and a pretty amazing conversion story of Paul. But look, it says it happens right here in verse 13. It says, Brethren, I count myself not to have apprehended. I haven't got it all figured out. I'm not at that place where I've done it all. But this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded. Whatever happened in the past, whatever failure was out there, whatever thing went wrong, wherever you let yourself down, and what, whatever happened in life, don't worry about that. Forget those things which are behind. Paul was saying that. He was probably thinking about the stoning of Stephen. Set those things behind you. I'm pressing on for the mark. There is a high calling of God in my life that he is calling me to. And if I look back on those things, the, the devil is going to use them as tools against me. But if I can continue to press, if I can continue to move forward, if I can just keep another step and say, Lord, I'm coming to you. I'm, I'm pressing on for the high calling in my life, that is what is going to make you a success in your Christian walk. It's pretty interesting that after all the understanding and all the things that Paul accomplished, he said, this one thing I do, I forget my failures. I forget about them. I turn, them, I turn aside from them and I look to what the Lord Jesus Christ wants to do in my life. Is there anybody today that wants to do a little pressing toward the mark? Is there anybody that's interested in the prize, the high calling of God in Christ Jesus? Is there somebody that say, Lord, I'm going to press. I'm going to push. I'm going to make room for the high calling of God in my life. Hallelujah. Would you give the Lord a hand clap of praise? God, would you call us? Lord, would you lead us? God, would you direct us into a high calling? of Christ in you, Lord. Would we allow your blood to wash us, Lord, and to cleanse us. God, to renew our minds in you in the name of Jesus. We pray. Amen. God bless you. Look forward to seeing you at Wednesday night Bible study at our house at 7 o'clock. We will be starting a new series. I've got two series that I'm looking at, and I don't know which one I'm going to do yet, so you have to come and find out. 7 o'clock on Wednesday night. God bless you all. Have a great time in the Lord Jesus Christ today.